All right, so here we go. <laughs> I will go ahead and get us started. Um, I'm Erica Montgomery. I am the chair of the outreach committee here at USC Upstate Library. The purpose of this session today is to give everyone um, an overview of how our committee was formed, why we thought a committee would be a better option than just one person doing outreach. We're gonna talk about kind of our day-to-day -day activities that we do or the things that we aim to do. Uh, we're talking about our goals overall, like for our plan, our outreach plan, and just kind of how we manage to do these things on a daily basis with a very limited budget. So that's what we're going to be getting into today. And with that said, I'm going to go ahead and let everyone else introduce themselves very quickly. So we'll start with Tessie. If you want to start us off. Hey there, I'm Tessie. I work at USC Upstate as an assistant in the Access Services Department. Thank you. Uh, Allison. Hi, um, I'm Allison Reed. I am a reference and research librarian here. Thank you. And then Michael. Good morning, everybody. My name is Michael Sanders, and I'm the archives assistant at USC Upstate Library. All right, awesome. And then finally, Mark. Hey, everyone. I'm Mark Smith. I'm a, a reference and research librarian here at Upstate. Thank you. Okay, so like I said, we're going to talk about um, the formation of our committee. And so I'm going to let Allison kind of take that away since she was the beginning of this committee. So Allison, if you'll start us off. Yeah, sure. So there's a bit of a story behind how the committee was formed. We used to have just one librarian who was in charge of outreach and social media. Um, she left the library and I was put in charge. Unfortunately, I'm not much of an artist, so I asked Erica um, to help me design the social media using Canva. The more I thought about it, the more I realized I wasn't forming a lot of ideas for outreach either. <laughs> um, I was also apprehensive of handling it all on my own. So I went to our dean and asked if I could form a committee. Um, fortunately, she thought it was a great idea. I was clear that I wanted both librarians and staff from different departments on the committee. Um, she and I both had suggestions for who would be good for the committee, and that is how the original committee was formed. Yeah, and then, so our original committee was me, Allison, Michael, and Tessie. And then later, we got Mark. And Mark, do you want to kind of explain how you got volunteered for this? Yes, uh, actually, that's that's what it was. I would call it voluntold. Um, I had a meeting with the dean to go over some ideas I had, and um, he suggested I consider joining this committee. Um, he, I, I don't I don't know if it was uh, because he liked my ideas or if he thought maybe uh, some folks ought to look after me. I'm either way. I'm just glad to be a part of the team. Um, thinking about this committee, I, I think. Um, one of our biggest strengths is our diversity. We pull from all areas of the library. Um, we've got uh, several librarians on here. We also have uh, um, staff members from Access Services and from Archives. And when the class is in, when the semester starts, we will also have uh, students on our, on this committee as well. Um, we also um, another. Another strength of the committee is uh, is that we we have the freedom to suggest anything. Um, ideas are welcome here. Uh, we're not afraid to you know try different things and, um, and 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 see where that goes. We have, however, um, identified the three areas that we want to focus our attention on, and um, it's uh, it's student engagement, uh, community outreach and collaborating with, with other departments on campus. And we'll go through that a little bit more as the presentation goes on. Yeah, and a main focus has been on student engagement since that's who we serve primarily, other than obviously faculty members. And part of that, like Mark said, is having a student on the actual committee. And Tessie actually was the one that kind of set that up. So Tessie, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Thanks, Erica. Uh, yeah, we uh, started to welcome a lot more student involvement in the committee in the past year. One of the things that we realized 
while we were doing these outreach efforts is that our students, and in particular, our student employees, were really eager to share their ideas and make suggestions about what they'd like to see the library do for students. And their ideas are phenomenal. Um, they also got to help out with various events that we'll be talking about today. And one of our student employees uh, expressed an interest in joining the outreach committee. So we tried that starting in spring 22 and found that they were a really valuable addition to the team. And they loved having that level of involvement in our efforts. Yeah, it's been really great having them on. We've got to see how having a student provide ideas, how well that actually works. Funny, you know, funny how that works. You know, students know what students want. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we have them and we're very excited that they wanted to even be on the committee. But now that we've kind of talked about the formation, we're going to get into kind of the main thing that we do on a daily basis, which is social media. The reason this is we put such a heavy and like, focus on social media is because we have a very small budget, a very, very small budget. And social media is for the most part free. <laughs> so that is how we kind of get the most interaction that we can for a very, very small fee or just free in general. So I'm actually going to let Allison talk about um, kind of our day-to-day -day social media um, activities, what we do, our kind of plan with that. Allison? Yeah, um, our social media presence consists of Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Instagram is the most popular platform for us and where we get the most interaction from students and faculty. We also use Hootsuite to schedule our social media posts. Um, we have a weekly plan for social media. Monday is for Did You Knows? or basic trivia about the library, such as study rooms are first come, first served, or that it is possible to book a librarian. Tuesdays used to be used for general advertisements, but now we post reviews for our Ask a Librarian service. Um, Wednesdays are for something called Meet the Library, where we introduce a library employee. Friday is free game. Um, and I'll let Michael tell you about what we do on Thursdays. Thank you, Allison. Uh, so on Thursdays, those are my wheelhouse in a sense because we use those for Throwback Thursday posts. Uh, since I work in the archives, I have access to various photographs or images that I could scan that are related to our campus's rich history from the archives and post them on our social media. Um, some, sometimes I'm potentially looking for something to post, but most of the time it's a happy accident where I'm already looking through something else for research or a request somebody has from the archives and I stumble across something like, oh, that'd be cool to post. And these are usually things regarding our mascot history, ceremonies, former students or professors, building dedications, famous visitors or anything that looks interesting. And I'll give you an example you see here on our slide on the left, very bottom right corner, is the golf team from 1970 on campus. And one of the players who was on that team at the time was Tommy Caldwell, who was the original bass player of the Marshall Tucker Band. Who knew he attended our campus? But it makes sense because he's a local from Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, and sometimes our Throwback Thursday posts get a lot of responses and comments. And besides what Allison just mentioned, uh, in the summertime, our posting focuses on uh, library hours. If there's anything different due to uh, holidays, or construction going on in the building or something out of order or a recent example is we had to close the building for a day because they cut the power off to do some electrical work. And then we'll post any events where we have going on in the library as well. And besides that, if there's anything we haven't already thought of or scheduled ahead of time to post, any one of us will just uh, think of something for general posting. Yeah. and. When we don't have specific things um, scheduled, a lot of the times we'll do, um, we'll utilize Instagram stories for smaller things, smaller announcements or stuff like that. We get a lot of interaction through these Instagram stories because a lot of times we get more views of those than the actual posts themselves. So we try to utilize that as much as possible. One way that we do that is we have nature breaks and this happens every Friday. And this is what this video is playing right now is some examples of that. It's I'll go around campus if it's like a nice day and just take a video, a 10 second video of just nature existing. And then I'll post that on Friday and we'll say, you know, relax your shoulders, stop scrolling or whatever, and just kind of take in nature. 
And we've gotten a lot of great responses from this, um, from students, from faculty on campus, as well as we even got a response from an alumni that was like, oh, you're making me miss campus. So this is just a fun, easy thing to do that people really enjoyed. And that's one way that we utilize our Instagram stories. Um, we also host some smaller um, events on there, which we'll mention later and give some examples of that. But yeah, like I said, this is where we get most of our interaction from um, students, faculty, all that. So Instagram stories is really, really a great, easy way to get some collaborations and all that. But next, I do wanna mention the social media policy just very quickly. It's something that Allison set up and I'm gonna let her talk about that. Yeah, we do have a social media policy. When the committee was formed, we inherited an old version of a policy. We reviewed it and made some slight changes, but it is basically the same. The policy says that we follow university guidelines and there is an appendix that is the university's policy. Um, we also specify what kinds of things we'll post and what types of comments are acceptable or unacceptable. Our policy does state that we reserve the right to edit, modify, or even delete certain posts or comments, but fortunately we haven't had to do that. <laughs> Yes, that is really great. <laughs> and um, it's just important to have a policy in place. Not that we're going to go crazy, but it's just nice to know some like what exactly we need to be looking forward to or what we need to be doing. But then there's also alongside social media, there's other advertising that we use. And I'm going to let Michael talk about that. Uh, so as Erica just mentioned, yeah, we use social media for advertising, but uh other ways we advertise and promote things, uh, we'll communicate to our campus program directors for approval for any of our events to be advertised across campus. Once we get their approval, we'll go uh, use chalk on campus sidewalks to advertise stuff, have ro rotating advertisements on TV screen prompts across campus. Uh, most recently, we started printing out flyers for our events, and I've personally uh, gone to every building on campus to uh, look at every bulletin board with other ads and flyers and posted our flyers on there. And then on occasion, we'll reach out to our marketing communications department to promote our events through campus-wide emails. That's usually always a good boost and push. Uh, and besides all of that, we just try in general do our best to make sure our bases are covered when advertising and promoting. Right, and we do have some examples on the screen right now of some advertising that we use. So on the left-hand side, this is an example of our what we'll put on the TVs across campus, just something small like this. And then on the right, you'll see a, an, an example of a flyer that we have put around campus before for one of our pet supplies donation drives. So these are just some ways that we um, use other advertising. But now that we've talked about social media and all that, I do want to mention that with the focus on social media, we needed to also start thinking about accessibility because that wasn't really something that we were thinking about before. And luckily we have someone on our committee um, who's very passionate about this topic. It's Tessie. <laughs> and she actually brought this to our attention and I'm going to let her talk about kind of what she told us we needed to start doing and just to help people out. So Tessie. Thanks, Erica. Uh, yeah, it's important to us to make sure that the content we create is usable by anybody. So uh, in spring 2022, we got together to talk about ensuring that our social media content is as accessible as possible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we have social media president, uh, presidents, like they said, on Instagram, on Facebook, and on Twitter. So the big three things we looked at were uh, appropriate contrast for the images that we're creating, providing alt text and image descriptions for the images that we share, and then making sure that the language we use is screen reader friendly, including hashtags and inventions. So right now I'm dropping some links into the chat of some resources that have been really helpful for us in this process, and I highly recommend you take a look at them. Um, all right, so to expand a little about this, though, one of the first things that we did was look at the colors we were using for the graphics we were creating and just making sure that the contrast between the words and the backgrounds was sufficient. Um, so one of the links you'll see is for WebAIM's contrast checker, uh, which makes this incredibly easy. You just input the colors and it's going to tell you whether it passes or fails the standards for contrast. Um, 
The next thing we looked at was ensuring that the graphics we post include alt text and or image descriptions. Um, so for people who don't know, alt text is just the metadata attached to the image to give someone using a screen reader a brief note about what that image is. So it's kind of the back end. And then an image description provides more details about that image. Um, if you look at the slide on the left, we have a picture that we shared of our new vending machines. Uh, we included an alt text for it that says picture of vending machines in the library. And uh, for somebody using a screen reader, uh, when the screen reader gets to that image, that's what it says. But in our posts, we also included an image description that provides a little bit more detail. So it tells you that it's full of snack food and Pepsi brand drinks. Um, we also looked at the way we're formatting the text in our posts and in particular hashtags. Something that we learned is that it's important when you're using multi-word hashtags to capitalize the first letter in order to uh, help screen readers pronounce each word. So that's called camel case, um, and it makes a big difference. For example, on the slide, you can see that we have a hashtag USC Upstate. If that's all lowercase, a screen reader is going to pronounce it Uscup Stata, which is not helpful in any way. But when you capitalize it, the screen reader knows to read it as USC Upstate. Uh, it allows it to differentiate the words, and that's super important. Um, so everybody was on board for making these changes and navigating making these changes across platforms took a few tries to figure out. But what we discovered was that it's really not hard to do. Several of us, we spent an afternoon gathered around my phone, testing out our posts on Apple's native screen reader, figuring out what worked and what didn't. And if you haven't done this before, I highly recommend you do. It's a really good way to get a better understanding of how low vision or blind people uh, experience the content that you're creating. Um, so in addition to the webbing contrast checker, I included a link to George Mason University's social media accessibility guide. It's really fantastic for just some basics. And then also the A11Y project project, which talks beyond social media, too, about the ways that we can increase our accessibility across our digital spaces. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this has been a huge, it has made a huge difference. And like she said, it's very easy to do uh, and to implement. So I definitely highly recommend if you're not already doing this, look into it. It's not hard. Um, but yeah, so now that we have talked about social media and accessibility, which is kind of the main things that we've been focusing on, I want to talk about kind of the first big success that we had as a um, committee, because this was an example of we had no money at this time. It was right when we had formed the committee, we had no money at all, no budget, and but we still wanted to host something in the fall. And we got an opportunity to win a, what they call the first 48 grant. And so at USC Upstate, we have this thing that we call the first 48, which is basically just the first 48 days of classes. And they try to host a bunch of events for students to kind of get them acclimated to campus and used to everything. And so we really wanted to be a part of this since we had no money, we needed some money. <laughs> so this is kind of what we were hoping for. And luckily we submitted the grant and we, we got it. And so this was kind of our first big success. And I wanna talk about what we did and how that kind of worked for us. I mean, I'm gonna let Michael start us off with that. Okay, so to give you guys a little backstory and context, uh, the mascot at USC Upstate is a cartoon human Spartan named Sparty. Uh, but fun fact, back in the 80s, uh, the campus had an unofficial mascot that was created by the students named Go Go Gorilla. And this mascot was a person in a full gorilla costume and a tank top who showed up at every sporting event to rally up the school's teams and crowds. Uh, and despite Go Gorilla not being an official mascot, he was loved and adored by the students, but slowly kind of faded out of existence at the beginning of the 90s. Uh, so our scenario for the rescue Sparty grant proposal was that Sparty was in the library doing research, but then was locked and trapped in a room by Go Gorilla that could not get out. Go Gorilla did this because he was jealous of Sparty's popularity and that no one remembers or adores him anymore. Once our grant proposal was accepted and approved, we received uh, $460 to make Rescue Sparty a reality. We used this money towards uh, creating clues and various decorative items to turn a classroom into the room where Sparty was trapped in. The next step after that was reaching out to our athletics department to borrow the Sparty mascot suit to use for our event. The athletics department graciously accepted our request and one other librarian and I took turns wearing the Sparty suit and saving the room for our students to find us in order to complete this escape room. And as I mentioned, uh, for this event, we received $460. Uh, 
but we ended up not using our entire budget on the escape room itself. Uh, most of our money went towards prizes for our students. And one thing I will add real quick is uh, now I can, uh, since I've been in a mascot suit, I can personally say those get hot very easily. And luckily I had uh, water and a fan on me, but hey, it can uh, cross off my bucket list that I was a mascot for a day. But uh, overall, I think uh, we think the entire event from start to finish turned out great. And we feel like we accomplished something tremendous here. Yeah, it was very successful. We were very happy about it. And I do want to mention in case I forgot to mention earlier, we did the event itself was an escape experience um, that we called Rescue Sparty. I'm not sure if I said that earlier. It's kind of like an escape room, but not really. Um, we didn't want it to be like escape the library because that's not a great connotation. But So it's kind of like an escape experience, help Sparty escape a room sort of situation. But um, yeah, it was very successful. And we um, did a lot of, uh, we had to create puzzles. And that was kind of the hardest part of planning was trying to figure out what kind of puzzles we wanted to do. And Allison, I'm going to let you talk about that. Um, yeah, we started out by Googling what kinds of puzzles are used in escape rooms and figuring out if they would work for our event. We got a lot of ideas that way and narrowed them down and altered them until we ended up with several puzzles, which we used for Rescued Sparty. And we have some examples here of they would solve puzzles and they would get like something like this text message conversation here where it shows where Sparty was last seen or at, in a text message that he sent. He took a selfie showing where he was last at. There's an email from a professor kind of saying what he was looking for. Those sort of things were part of the experience and um, little things like that. And it took them all throughout the library. So as you'll see in these pictures, we have students um, in study rooms, in the actual stacks themselves, um, doing all these different puzzles and working through those. So it was an opportunity for students to go throughout the library and get to know things on them. Um, like on accident, not on purpose. They're learning on accident, which was kind of our goal with this. And a great thing about this is we had a lot of help from other library employees. Um, and I'm going to let Mark talk about that since he was one of the people that helped us out. So Mark? Yes. Um, this uh, All of this was before I was part of the outreach committee, um, but I, I work uh, real close with, um, with Erica and the librarians and as they were putting it together, um, I don't know, it just, it looked like, you know, too much fun that, you know, for me to not be involved. So um, I worked through some of the puzzles, just, you know, looking at the, the stuff that they were doing. And um, I ended up uh, coming one night and helping uh, at the desk. That was part of the, um, part of the maze the students had to go through. In fact, even, even the Dean um, of the library, uh, uh, rolled his sleeves up and pitched in. He was he was part of it too. So um so it was really good that that, that, that we had such buy in by the by the whole library. Pretty much, it it really made this thing a a hit. Yeah, we were very thankful that we had so much support from everyone because it's one thing for four people to be able to put something on, but if you have help from everybody else, it makes it ten times easier. And I do want to mention. Before I show pictures from um, the, of the mascot and all that fun stuff, I did forget to mention our advertising for this, which is something that I wanted to talk about. Obviously, we did social media posts and we had like, have you seen Sparty? Sparty needs your help, like those sort of things to kind of draw attention to it. Um, anytime we had a table at an event, we would promote it there. We also did um, our like writing on chalk on the ground. We would put like, have you seen Sparty with a little link to the sign up sheet. Uh, Tessie at one point was going around the library and all of the whiteboards, she would write, have you seen Sparty? And then put a little QR code to um, the sign up sheet. So we did a lot of advertising. We had the TVs, we did all that. And I think that that's what helped make it very successful is that we just advertised it everywhere that we possibly could think of. And I did want to mention that. And then lastly, I'll just show some photos of, this is what students would come to once they found Sparty. And this is actually Michael in the Sparty costume right here, but they would go in and they could just take pictures with them, selfies, whatever they wanted. On the left-hand side, we do have a picture of Go Go Gorilla. Um, so this is kind of what they would walk into and see. And the students were super excited about meeting the mascot. We didn't think they would be that excited, but they really were. 
So that was just kind of a fun thing that we got to do. So now that we have talked about this grant and our kind of first success, I want to get into some other outreach activities that we do. Um, and I'm going to let Allison start us off with that. Yeah, um, one of the ongoing outreach activities we have is our prompt table. This started as a paper from a roll stretched out over a table, but now we have a table with a whiteboard service. And every week or so, we write a question at the top of the table and the students answer. This is very popular. <laughs> One of our most popular prompts was when we asked upperclassmen to share words of wisdom with the first year students. We got a lot of great advice and we ended up displaying the paper on one of the library walls for several weeks. Um, another outreach activity we do each semester is during exam weeks. The library has the table at the building's entrance where we provide snacks and small stress reducers for anyone to grab. Um, stress reducers like coloring pages with crayons and markers and pieces of bubble wrap. The bubble wrap is very popular and we're constantly refilling the bowls. Um, we also have the interactive dry erase board table where students can write something to encourage each other during exams. Um, one other thing I want to talk about is we have a mascot. Um, the students named our library mascot using the prompt table. So how did we end up with the library mascot, you may ask? Um, it started when we decided to have library t-shirts designed for all of our employees to wear. Um, the design ended up having a goose on it because there are Canada geese all over campus. In order to justify the shirt design, I bought a little stuffed Canada goose toy and we decided it could be our mascot. But all mascots should have names, right? So we put the question out on the prompt table and got tons of suggestions. We narrowed it down to a few of our favorites and then held voting bracket style on Instagram. Eventually the name Gustavo was chosen. Um, we take Gustavo to all of our events and highlight him in social media from time to time. His home base is at the reference desk, and the students love Gustavo even more than we thought they would. Yeah, it was kind of shocking how much, how excited they were about this mascot and how much they love him. Um, I think they really enjoyed getting to name the mascot, so that kind of made it their own thing as well. So it's been really cool that they appreciate this as much as they do. And it's been fun just taking them everywhere and getting to, you know, promote them all the time. <laughs> um, we also, for Homecoming, actually, Tessie created some buttons that were to the theme of Homecoming, which was James Bond. And she created Gustavo James Bond buttons, which are pictured here. Um, and they went super fast, like, and because obviously we just let people just grab them for free. And they went very fast. We had to make more. So this was just something fun that we could do with Gustavo. Yeah. So with that said, there is some other things that we do like information tables. So Michael, if you want to talk about those. Um, yes. Uh, before I get into the information table, um, I will show off something that Allison just mentioned about the shirts. Uh, I'll turn around real, real quick. Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there's our shirt. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Designed by students, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, we do, like Erica said, we do information tables uh, in the library and across campus. Uh, one I'll mention real quick is during the first two days of classes, every fall semester, we plan and collaborate with our student affairs to have tables and tents in front of the library and other spots on campus for an event we call Where's Our Classroom? This is an event where we get the whole library department involved to help us out. At these tables, we pass out snacks and campus maps while engaging with any student who might need help with finding a classroom or a building on campus. And the students seem to be always very grateful for our help. We always get positive feedback from this event. This information table is our most popular one and has the largest turnout each year. In fact, last year alone, we helped and interacted with 567 students. And then throughout 
each semester we reach out to students at other campus-wide events with uh, information tables. These are events uh, known as the Premier Fair, Winter Blast, and Student Transfer Orientations. At these events, we prepare and organize a table of bookmarks and snacks, while also providing inf any information they might have about what the library or the university provides. And these are all events that we've been uh, doing for the past couple of years or adding to our, to do uh, and do their host and attend for the past couple of years. And so far, I think we've been very successful with promoting the library and connecting with our students. Oh yeah, it's been really nice to get to just get those one-on-one -on -one interactions. And the more that we grow um, as a committee, the more that we're being asked to attend these sorts of things and have these information tables. So it's been really nice. We're getting a lot more interactions that way. And earlier I mentioned um, Instagram stories, using those to sort of promote things that way or to hold smaller events. And we do have some examples here. I'll go through very quickly. So we had um, Halloween. For Halloween, we just hid some treat bags around and gave out clues to where they were. And it was only exclusively on Instagram stories. And this is another one of those things where we thought, oh, maybe a few students will be interested. It we'll just do a few little bags. And we got a huge response to it. So if you ever think like, oh, maybe they wouldn't like this, they, they might. <laughs> they, anything fun like this where they get to find something, a scavenger hunt or whatever like this, they tend to really enjoy it. So just try it, see what happens. Um, but that was something we did. We also have the second photo Tessie went to a trunk or treat event, which was held for the Spartanburg community itself, not just the campus. And she represented our library there um, that way. And then finally, this last photo, we attended a student held event. And um, actually, one of our student workers was the head of that um, organization. And we wanted to visit just to show up and show that we were supporting them. And that was great because we got to talk directly with students that way. And we also got to show our support for a student organization representing the library itself. And I think they really appreciated that we did that. So that's something that we want to continue to do. Um, if it's an event that everyone is welcome to, we want to show up and, you know, just represent ourselves there. And then finally, I do want to mention our community outreach, because this is something that we've started over the past um, year we've started doing charity events or charity donation drives that reach the Spartanburg community itself, as well as our campus. And this began with um, a collaboration with the Period Project, which I'm going to let Allison and Tessie talk about that. Hey, yeah, um, so Erica had gotten connected with a volunteer for the Spartanburg Period Project at a university event and was interested in organizing a drive. And luckily for me, she allowed me to take the lead on that. So uh, we had the inaugural period project drive at the library last year. I coordinated with the head of the local chapter and we decided on a month long drive throughout October, marketed towards students and employees. Uh, so the goal is to connect, uh, collect enough products to host a period packing party in November, where we would package various menstrual products into period packs that can be distributed to schools and also to shelters. Uh, throughout the month, we got uh, hundreds of dollars in product donations and then $160 in cash donations, which Allison and I used to purchase products that we needed more of in order to complete the packs. Then it was time for the period packing party, and so we invited all library staff, including our student employees, to participate, and we had a fantastic turnout. Uh, we were able to make about 175 period packs to go out into the community, and then we've been able to use the extra products left over uh, to stock our library restrooms with free menstrual products. Yeah, and that's been great. And after the packing party, I reached out to the leader of the Spartanburg Period Project and became a volunteer because I was looking for something to volunteer for. Um, I do things like deliver the packs to schools and community centers, and I also participate in other packing parties throughout the year. There's one coming up this weekend, actually. Um and as I have kept a relationship with Spartanburg Period Project, I'm going to coordinate this year's drive in October. Um, I'm going to include a link in the chat for the Period Project. I'm going to drop that in the chat real quick. Yeah, this is something that um, has been a huge success. And so we wanted to continue doing things like that. Um, 
And we got donations not only from, you know, library employees, but students and other faculty members as well. So this is a great way to get the whole campus involved um, and just kind of help the community itself. Uh, some other drives that we've done, we did sharing the warmth, which we have a picture of one of our advertisements. We were a drop-off location for that. And so that was like hats, um, gloves, anything warm for the winter time. They could drop off those here at the library. We also did the pet supplies donation drive, which was pictured kind of earlier. And then the other thing that we do during the summer is the we have a Spartan pantry here on campus that is basically people can donate food or cleaning, uh, cleaning supplies that students can get for free if they need those sort of things. And so we try to donate to that every summer. Um, so yeah, we try to at least do one charity each semester. And that's kind of our main aim for each semester. But yeah, so those are some things that we do that aren't directly related to campus, but more towards the community, because we figure even though we're not a public library, Spartanburg community itself is very tight knit and we wanna be a part of that and we want to contribute to that. So that is sort of the end of our day-to-day -day activities or our kind of our plan, our typical um, schedules, I guess. I don't know how the best way to describe it, but that's kind of what we do on a regular basis. And all of this is with a very limited budget. So we're obviously doing a lot, but it's not costing us a ton of money. So these are, we try to find things that are very easy to do and cheap to do. <laughs> and with that in mind, I do want Mark to kind of talk about the future or get us started on talking about our future as a committee. Yes, um, to say the least, uh, the future is going to be busy. Um, as was mentioned earlier uh, with, uh, uh, the, with the students, uh, where's my classroom? We had 567 um, uh, interactions with the students. Um, we're, we're bringing that back. Um, that, and then we're going to do uh, we're, the county library. We're partnering with, uh, with Sparmer County Library and bringing them out to do a library card drive um, that would open up, uh, allow our students to access all the things that uh, the public library offers that, that we can't offer them. Um, we are also going to have a, a voting registration information tables that will staff for our students to answer questions and figure out, you know, how they can get registered to vote. And uh, the last thing would be uh, we're um, going to do the Spartanburg period project. That's just a sort of a quick list of uh, what's coming up next semester. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we have a lot planned. And the good thing is we have so much support from other library employees and our dean as well. And that's going to help us, you know, be able to put on all these things and do all these things as having that support. And the, that support system is going to be huge. Um, we really just want to put a focus on student engagement, community outreach, and um, just trying to help out and get our names out there as much as possible, because a lot of times libraries are not the main focus on a campus. And so we want to make sure that we're there for people and we're trying to make it as useful for students as possible by taking their suggestions and using them, not just asking to ask, but actually using what they offer us to make the library a better space for them. But with that said, that is our presentation. That's what we have for you. Um, does anybody have any questions? I, I know I saw a bunch in the chat, so I guess we'll just go ahead and start that. Hi, yes, you have several questions actually. Um, <laughs> some, of, some of which are very similar. So I'm gonna go ahead and lump these two together. How do you assess the impact of your social media engagement and how do you do it? Uh, how do you uh, assess that during your campus events? Well, for social media, we kind of just look at, um, you know, how many likes or how many views we have on a story. And then um, how many, you know, message, direct messages we get. That's kind of how we measure that engagement. It's not really kind of set in stone how we do that. Um, but as far as like actual events, we have a thing here on campus called presence or is it a goji? Is that what it is? Or is it the other word that I can never remember? Agora? Agora. Agora. That's what it is. It's kind of like they, um, it, I think it was implemented for COVID. And it's where students can input or sign up for events, and then they can 
put their COVID status and they can rate the event. They can say all the things that they've been to. And that's what we use to kind of measure um, the reaction to events, how many people were there, all that fun stuff. We also have our own set of statistics that we take for each event, which is basically just whatever information we get from the Agora thing. And we just put that in for ourselves as well. So that's kind of how we measure the success or the engagement that we get for those events. Does that answer those questions? <laughs> I, I, I believe so. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the next question is, you mentioned Canva. Do you pay for a premium subscription for this tool? I'm going to let Allison answer that because I believe she was the one when we got that. She, or at least she knows more about that. I'm supposed to know more about that. <laughs> um, I can't remember. I don't think. I believe we do have a premium subscription. Yeah, I'm I not think sure we do what. have a premium because we we pay for Hootsuite too, and so I think we also pay for a Canva. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe so. Yes, I believe it's a premium subscription. All right. Your next question is: How did the pandemic impact your outreach? I mean, if anyone else can feel free to answer, I can start us off, but it was, I mean, definitely slash the budget. <laughs> Not that we really had like a massive one to begin with, but we started off when we formed the committee, we had zero dollars <laughs> and which is why we wanted to do the grant so badly because that gave us any sort of money. But um, it also kind of made us focus on social media and once we started doing that, we got a lot more interactions that way, which I've said in the presentation itself, but we got, we started to get more direct messages from students and from faculty itself. And then like sharing um, posts from other faculty members and those things, things that you can't just do in person. We started to get a lot more interactions that way. So it was kind of a blessing, <laughs> but yeah, it definitely affected the budget and that's kind of the major way that it affected us. And also just when we hosted events, we had to be sure that we were following those guidelines um, for COVID. Um, does it, anybody it, else have anything they want it, to add for that? I was just going to follow up with, uh, you know, how it sharpened our social media skills. I mean, it, that, that was about the only tool we had in the shed that still worked. Um, so, uh, so now we can, you know, really get around on it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? <laughs> but yeah, um, hopefully that answered your question. I mean, it's probably obvious, but the budget was the main thing. <laughs> All right. You have another question. How many students are members of your committee and what majors are represented in that student group? I, actually, Tessie, why don't you take that away? Yeah. <laughs> Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so we this past spring was our first time inviting students formally onto the committee. So uh, just to start, we had one student um, and that went over really well. Um, so we're hopefully going to be able to uh, get more students involved this fall. Uh, we still have student hiring to do for the fall semester. So uh, once we get those students hired, we'll be able to see. And uh, we've talked about also expanding possibly outside of just student employees, but we have... Um, we have such a great pool of student employees generally, and then we also find that it does get them more invested in what they do at the library and kind of expose them more to what the world of libraries can be. Um, and to that end, we have had student employees who have changed their uh, career plans, including the person who was on our committee last semester, uh, has now uh, transitioned over into work in public libraries because they loved it so much. Um, and so the ideas, though, that we've been getting from students who uh, are giving these ideas, we have students who have uh, computer science majors, history majors, um, kind of just all over the place. But uh, all of them are kind of united in um, their love for the library and their investment in seeing us do things that really connect with the students. Yeah, and I think, and I think it helps that we actually listen to their ideas and implement them. And I do want to mention earlier, I said that Tessie made those Gustavo buttons, but I do want to say a student was the one that came up with that idea. Am I correct? Yeah. So 
we get great ideas from them. And that student got to see their idea become a reality. And I think that's what helps them feel connected to the library and like actually enjoy their job, <laughs> or at least we hope. But. We have a couple more minutes and two more questions. Uh, have you been able to reach enough students for events and outreach using the free versions of social media, or have you tried any paid ads to reach a wider audience? We've just done anything free since our budget was, you know, very limited. Um, we had truly didn't even think about paid ads um, to get to a wider audience. I think once we start getting money um, into the budget, and a, a lot of the budget that we had the past year went to just getting basic things that we didn't have to begin with. So I'm hoping that now that money can be reallocated to things like that, where we can get our selves out there even more if we have to pay for things. But yeah, we truly didn't even think paid ads were a possibility, <laughs> but um, that is something that we'd be interested in trying. But yeah, using the social media and just flyers, TVs um, that are already on campus, chalk art, anything that we could do that got ourselves out there quite a bit. <laughs> All right. Uh, the next one is, what are some things you do to find new ideas and strategies that have impact? Um, does anybody else want to, I feel like I'm talking a lot. Does anybody, Allison, you want to say something? Um, the way I've gotten new ideas is by going to conferences like this mm -hmm. and going to webinars and seeing what other schools are doing. Um, that's that's how I get my ideas. I just copy other people. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, some some yeah, form of we, networking. Um, you know that just seeing what other people, you know, what other people do. It's um, the world's gotten a lot smaller these days. Yeah, and I'll add to that. You know, just hit and miss, trial and error. But uh, sometimes a little pop culture with knowing our students helps a little bit as well. Well, right, and that's the thing. We ask our students what they think we should do. That helps a huge, like, that's how we get ideas right there. Um, we also, la or this summer, we had a meeting with the entire library and said, hey, I know we're the committee, but we want your ideas as well. And they brought up a lot of great things that they had seen from other conferences or they had created. And so it's kind of just getting ideas from all over the place and seeing what sticks and what we think we can actually do. Um, but yeah, that's, we kind of just look out and ask as many people as possible um, and hope that we can make something work. I believe this is our last question. Okay. How is your budget determined? Okay, Allison, that's another thing I'm going to field to you because I've just recently become the chair and I've not heard, I've not been privy to this yet. <laughs> okay, well, I don't think our budget is determined by any significant process. I think our budget is determined by how much the library just happens to have on hand <laughs> because we've gone through budget cuts a lot through the past few years with the pandemic and with other issues um and so the library budget it's just whatever the dean feels he can give us i mean there's really no set reason <laughs> or like yeah which it makes it always interesting <laughs> keeps us on our toes yeah 